Psalms 119, verse 33. And if your Psalms are marked to the Jewish alphabet, right above your verse 33 would be hey. It should say H E, it has a little symbol. That's the Jewish alphabet, if your Bible has that. And we're trying to do uh, 16 verses or two of the alphabets of the Jewish language as we work our way through the entire chapter of Psalms 119. And Psalms 119 is pretty much all about the Word of God. Teach me, O Lord. That's who's going to teach you. The Holy Spirit. You got a good pastor? You got a good Sunday school teacher? You got a good instructor? It's not them. You say, Brother Stella, I learned much from you. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit that works through us. The inspiration that, that God, through the Holy Spirit, is allowing us to be vessels to carry the Word of God that thank the Lord, not us. Now, you got somebody, a pastor, teacher, or instructor, and they're giving credit to themselves and how that right there shows you it's not the Holy Spirit. The way of thy statutes, again, we're in the law. Statutes, judgments, commandments, law. That's all the Old Testament. Not the church age, but we can spiritualize and we will look at the church age Christian when we have opportunity. And I shall keep it, the statutes, unto the end. Now, unto the end is an expression found in Matthew, found in Hebrews. To the end. Give me understanding. I mean, it's not a piece of paper you hang on a wall. Knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is how to apply what you know. Understanding is your reference to know God. You can drive a car. You can know how to drive a car. Wisdom is when you get in that driver's seat, you put the key in the ignition, you turn it on, you put it in gear and you start going down the road. Understanding is when you pick up somebody and bring them to church. So he's saying, I want understanding. He doesn't go running to him. He goes to God. And I shall keep thy law, the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Yea, I shall observe it. With my whole heart. Oh, we can get Christian to do that with the word. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. True service, true salvation of God ain't your brain. It's your heart. And Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful. Jesus says out of the heart comes all the sin. And out of the heart comes belief in Jesus Christ. And out of, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm not only going to just read the Bible, but I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to look to God speaking to me, and that's your heart. He'll fill your head with, with knowledge, but it's the application of your heart. I'm going to memorize scripture, and it don't go in your head. It goes in your heart. Make me, make me, make me, force me to go in the path of thy commandments. Again, there's a law. And the Christian has commandments. We're to study the word. We're to go in all the world and preach the gospel. We're to pray without ceasing. We're to love the brethren. Make me do it, God. And yet it's a free will. Because there's sometimes you don't want to do it. There are some Christians that, did, man, they just aggravate you. You don't hate them. You just, oh, man. Lord God, help me, make me.
Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. You know, we say the, the law makes you guilty. The law can't make you right. The law makes you a schoolmaster say, hey, you know what? You sinned against God. Can I use the law to save me? Absolutely not. But what God has written, what little he, listen, the guy who's writing Psalms 119 doesn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all the New Testament. I don't even know how much of the Old Testament he has. And if he's lived up to Solomon and the temple, well, he don't have Jeremiah. He don't have the, 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 the prophets. What he has, and I'm not sure how much he had, I love it. I enjoy it. I'm satisfied. And yet the satisfaction is, I don't get enough. We'll look at that in a moment. Incline my heart unto thy testimony is another thing of the law. Whatever God has done. The testimonies of Jesus, he healed. He had the dead uh, resurrected. He healed those that were possessed with devils. The blind received their sight. The deaf heard. Those are testimonies of Jesus. He, he preached and taught in their cities. He, he had 12 men that followed him. He went all the way to, that's the testimony. God caused darkness in the land of Egypt. He caused the Red Sea to part and the dry ground. The Israelite walked on. And when the enemy went through, he, he closed up the Red Sea upon their, that's testimony. And not to covetousness. Now, Paul says in Romans, and likens covetousness to lust, and lust to covetousness. But when we come 36 verses of Psalms 119, and he wants the word, he, he, he asks God for it. Make me, Lord God. Teach me, Lord God. Help me. I reach out. I want. I desire. I meditate. Give me. So we learn from 36 verses. Covetousness is a sin. It's likened by the Apostle Paul to lust. But when you covet the word of God and what God has to say, that's not a sin. And you would find the very same case for the Christian written. Study to show thyself. Get more. Read your Bible. Seek your Bible. And when you read the Bible and you seek the Bible for the treasures of God to do right, it's not going to be wood, hay, or stubble. Now, if you're going to look at the Bible, you're going to read at the Bible and say, well, I, I, I can erase this. Well, you know, that's not in the original Hebrew. Well, the Greek means this. Well, you know, I have to add to because because God didn't know what he was talking about. Let me. And when you're going to read the Bible, such as Thomas Jefferson went and read and changed his Bible to his own liking. Well, that's covetous and that's sin. But for a man that's in the law that wants to have favor of God and for a Christian today who wants to be approved of God in hell and to be the hair well done. And for a man going through the tribulation period that the word of God is, how do I get out of this? What am I going to do? What is the ways, Lord, you have me to do through the seven years? That's a good covetousness. That's a good one thing. And it would not go in the step of lusting because who would ever really want to lust after the desire of the word of God? And there's probably some out there. Their lust is to be filled. Listen, the Bible says in the book of Acts that there, there were a, a, a group of people that they, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, when they addicted themselves. To the word of God. That's coveting. That's a good coveting. That's a good addiction. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. 
nothing. Absolutely no. Has no value. It, it, it doesn't do God any good. It doesn't do you any good. It would be turn off the television set. Put the magazines away. Put the fiction books away. You don't, you don't need to be looking at this stuff. And quicken, we already saw that means to be made alive. Quicken me, make me alive though through that. And quicken thou, God, me in thy way. Make me alive in thy way. Give me life. And Jesus says, I am the way. But they did not know that then. I'm reading again through, through the book of Luke, and I'm just amazed by it. somebody made a statement. A couple of times so I've heard people say his name. They were looking forward to Calvary. And now, you know, I've looked up that question, and I'm going through the Luke, Luke today, and, and Jesus addresses the people, and Peter's like, what? And Jesus told them over and over, I'm going to die. They're going to turn me over. In three days, I'm going to be resurrected from the dead. Oh, what? Because establish thy word unto thy servant. Again, we looked at that word servant. Here's somebody who's serving God. God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to do it for? Where do you want me to do it? What do you want me to do? When do you want me to do it? How do you want me to do it? And whatever I do to who, what, where, why, and when, and how, let it be established by what the word of God says. You know where you fail? You know where the failed churches, you know where the failed religion is? When they have an establishment that is not set by what God says. But by what man said, by tradition and other again, a guy. Well, that's what I was taught. Well, I'm sorry. Aren't you getting tired of me telling you what the man taught you was wrong? What does the Bible say? I was even taught in school, you know, every time someone asked Jesus a question, he had an answer for them. But when he had a question for them, no man could answer him. And, oh, okay. And I read in the Bible where Jesus is standing before Pilate and Pilate asked Jesus a question and he gave no answer. I read where the high priest has got Jesus right there and the high priest asked Jesus a question and Jesus gave no answer. Okay, I'm sorry for my, I don't know who, what the, the instructor's name is, but the person that said that, you're wrong. What made you wrong? The Bible made you wrong. And we got to be careful we don't say things that contradict the Bible. Because then we're wrong, and then we make ourselves a liar. Who is devoted to thy fear. He fears God. The, begin, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs said. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. For thy judgments are good. The judgments? Now, sometimes we make the law, <clears throat> we make the law, you know, it's evil, it's, it makes you, you know, it can't save you, it shows you a sin you are, and we make it, sometimes we make it, we make it look bad, we make it look ill, but Paul says, except, again, except, the, you know, the law said, thou shalt not covet, I would not have known about lust. The law is good. I mean, it is perfectly well that you honor thy father and mother. It's respectful. It's honorable. And, well, what if we don't honor our parents? Look at America in 2020, in June. Look at all the young adults out there who has no respect for their police, have no respect for their parents, have no respect for the teachers, have no respect for others. That's the trouble. And what is going on is not good because you have left the word of God. So throughout the Old Testament, listen, the law, the law is what Moses wrote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The, the, you know, the, the law is, the story of Noah is a wonderful story and that's in the law. The story of the garden, even before the fall. That's a wonderful, beautiful story. That's in the law. 
God calling out one man named Abram. That's a beautiful story in the law. How God saved a man called Lot and tried to save his wife and his two daughters. That's in the law. It's beautiful. Okay, then what happened with his daughters? That's not so good. But there are beautiful things in the law. I mean, I mean, what the law says, you get a tattoo. The law shows you what God thinks about tattoos. They're not good. The law tells us if you eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, it's not only the law, but before the law, during the law, and in the church, it's wrong. It is good to know, all right, what the teaching of the Bible, that religion is totally wrong, and that does not satisfy God. But I got to get away from it. That's good. Because I know what God doesn't like. The fact is that Noah got out of the ark, and then he got drunk, and there was trouble. The first drunkenness in the Bible. Oh, maybe I should go out and get drunk. No, wait a minute. No, it's not because the law says it wasn't good for, for Noah, and it shows us good. I better not do it. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Oh, if a Christian would do that, if a pastor would do that, if a Sunday school teacher would do that, if an instructor would do that, say, oh, I want to know the word of God. Yet again, you're going to hear this over and over. You're going to be able to quote the verse. Our epistles to the church says, study to show thyself. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than two edged, any two edged sword. Quicken, make me alive. In thy righteousness, what is going to make you alive? God's righteousness. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Now, the next set we got, it could be vow or vag, the B A U. Vag or beg or vow. Let thy mercies, and God's full of victory, uh, full of mercy, come also unto me. God, I'm looking for some mercy. You may have a quick, can I ask God for mercy? He is. Bible answer question. I mean, you just say, can I ask God for mercy? He is. Come also unto me. Come unto me, thou shalt be blessed. Let thy mercies come also unto me. You know what he's saying, God? Come and show me mercy. I need it. O oh Lord, even thy salvation. Whose salvation is it? It's God. According to thy word. Now remember, the writer of the Psalms 119 does not have the New Testament. He doesn't have, what shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. He doesn't have Philip talking Ethiopian. If thou believe that Jesus Christ. So there is salvation in the law according to the word of God. Now, an Old Testament person who obeyed what God told him to do, he didn't go to heaven. He went to Abraham's bosom, but he didn't go to hell. Even the law and before the law, that there was a way not to go to hell. That's salvation. There are people in the law times and before the law, there are people who lived who went into hell and is in hell today. And there are men like Judah and Abraham and Sarah and David and Solomon who have died in the Old Testament and they're in Abraham's bosom when they died and God saved them from hell. So you cannot say according to the word and according to Saul, well, there is no salvation in the New Testament. Yes, there was. It's not our salvation. There was no belief upon Jesus. There was belief upon if I bring a certain animal, if I do a certain sacrifice. Even Job, long before the law, 
Man, he was offering sacrifices for his own children. Long before the law, you got the first family. Abel shows up to God at an altar and he brings blood. And Abel, Abel, Abel dies and goes to, I don't know what's called Abraham's bosom. Abraham wasn't around yet. But he died in the salvation of God through the blood. And whatever happened to his soul, it did not go to hell. And when Jesus Christ suffered and died and, and bled, and according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and Abel's body and soul came out of that grave, but Cain, his brother, is still in hell. And he says, according to salvation, according to the word, as much <coughs> Excuse me. As much as the gospel is that Jesus Christ is suffering according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, so was the Old Testament's salvation. Though they didn't go to heaven, their salvation was according to what the law, according to what God spoke to them. And Job had no book. Job's the first book to be written. The first book of the Bible to be written, Job, was written as Job is living it. Listen, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all that was not written until Moses went up in the mountain after Exodus 20. Verse 42. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproaches me, for I trust in thy word. 1 Peter 3.15 says we are to give answer to anybody who has a question according to the word. So I shall wear in to answer him that reproaches me. Look at, look at 1 Peter 3.15. It's almost like maybe Peter had this in mind, the Holy Spirit had this in mind. Because Peter says in 3.15, verse Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, that matches Psalms 119, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Peter, yes. What is this Jesus that you're, that you're man, you, you're wonderful, you're, you're well, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you the scripture. And the writer of the psalm, so I shall have wherewith to answer him that reproach. Now, the writer of the psalm is like, you know, he's asking a question, but he, you know, he's being challenged. Peter is like, hey, somebody wants to know about the whole. Somebody wants to know about Jesus. Answer them. Psalms 119. If someone gives you a hard time and wants to fight with you, give them an answer. Whether they're debating with you or whether they're really asking. What do you do? The Bible, scripture with scripture, rightly divide. You're to give them an answer according to the word. Don't give them what other men said. Give them what the Bible says. And you better be ready. He says, for I trust in thy word. You're going to give the answer. <coughs> According to what Peter has said, according to what the psalmist said, by reading and studying the Bible, because you trust the Bible. You're not going to have good, sure Bible answers if you're doubt and if you're not relying on the word. You're going to fail. Listen, I, I established that with someone trying to teach the Bible. Oh, I don't even, I've been a long time since I read the Old Testament. I can tell. I can tell. You don't have to have all. Listen, sometimes the best answer is I don't know. When you don't know, I say, listen, if, honestly, let me find the answer. And honestly, go try to find the answer. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. Look, look what he's saying. And he doesn't have 66 full books of the Bible like we have. Job says, I have seen the words of the Lord with more than my necessary me. Job, what on earth are you talking about? You have no word of God. You have no Bible. 
We got Job who doesn't even have a Bible at all. Says the word of God is my meat and potatoes. The psalmist who's got the law says, don't take it out of my mouth. And the church epistles, we got the entire, well, no, they don't have the entire book. When Paul's writing the epistle, all right, Corinthians, well, he don't have the Corinthians, he's writing it. We're the ones that have the entire, we have the entire word of God today, straightforward, and we can open it up, we can buy it, we can get it online, and yet we're the generation not to look at the word of God, not to seek the word of God. And we fill our bookstore with shelves and shelves of men who written books about the Bible instead of reading the Bible. For I have hope. In thy judgment. I have hope in the word. I have hope in the law. I hope God I do right so you don't judge me. That's what he's saying. Lord God, I hope I don't ever be like those Egyptians. And listen, there's places in there with like the Egyptians. There's notes I got in my Bible. Oh, Lord God, don't ever let me be like Pharaoh. And there'll be circumstances where, where people or a person, they just utterly re reject the Bible, reject the word of God, and reject what God said. And, re and I say, Lord God, don't let me ever be like that. That's what he's saying. God, let me never come to the point where you have to judge me. Jeremiah says something like, correct me, Lord, with... Uh, with, with with thy anger, but not not hot. Not when you're very angry. So shall I keep thy law. Oh, look at that. I keep thy law continually forever and ever. The law said that the king, and this is not the king, but the law said for the king, he is to write down a copy of his own law. And you know, not once anywhere in the kings, second kings, Samuels and the not once does it ever say that a king actually copied the whole law or any of the law, including David. But he says, Let me keep it. It's funny how huh? you come up an Ethiopian eunuch, keep the law. Well, he kept the prophets, he's got a copy of Isaiah 53, he's reading on the way home. I will walk at liberty, freedom, freedom from restraint, for I seek thy precepts. I've got freedom to say, God, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. God, I ain't going to obey one word of the God. I ain't going to do it. Nope. I got freedom. I can, and this is the time of the temple or, or the tabernacle. I can go to the tabernacle and go to the temple and bring my animal. Or I don't have to. People today, I can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, or I don't have to. We got liberty. But what about the responsibility? The responsibility is the judgment, in verse 43. You say, what are you talking about? All right, if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to have wood, hair, stuff. But I'm going to have gold, silver, precious stones. Hold. I have a home in glory. I'm going to be before God one day through Jesus because I obeyed the word of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I've done that. An lost man, we go out there telling him to believe on Jesus. Jesus is the way. No. Whatever his way is, even if he has no way, I refuse. His judgment, his responsibility is God will throw him into the lake of fire that burns forever. My liberty received Jesus Christ, and the responsibility is I go to glory. For a man to reject Jesus Christ, the responsibility. He goes off to hell and pays for his own sin. A man in the Old Testament, okay, I'm to bring a lamb. Here's a lamb. That's not a good enough lamb. Let me go get a better lamb. What's he get? 
Wait, well, he gets prosperity from God in the Old Testament. He gets God taking care of him. He gets land. And when he dies, he goes off to Abraham's bosom. What if I don't want to do what God tells? What if I want to go my own way? And the rich man died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. That's his responsibility for his liberty. The rich man said, oh, I've got plenty of stuff. I'm going to tear down my barn. I'm going to build more barn. I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. I, I, that's my reaction to, to what God says. And my responsibility is I'm going to die tonight. I'm going to go to hell. That's liberty. We got a Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, but we do not have a statue, statue called Responsibility. And what we have not taught our kids today, the reason why we got problems of riots and all that today, is we have not taught the child, hey, you got the liberty, go ahead. What do you got the responsibility? We don't teach responsibility. We got a whole bunch of men coming up this weekend, Father's Day. We got a whole bunch of men out there, liberty, uh, 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 fornicating with, with girls. But they don't want the responsibility of fatherhood. So they got a whole bunch of kids running around and don't even know who their father is. Why are there fatherless children today? Because the male didn't want to take responsibility, but he wanted the liberty. Sex education in schools today. Hey, you got the liberty. Oh, you got pregnant? Well, go ahead. We'll bring you to the place and we'll just have the baby removed. Well, you know, it's abortion, and we can do that. And But they don't tell you about responsibility of the guilt you'll get for murdering that child. And we'll just give you pills, and, and we'll give you something so you can just blow your mind so you don't think about it. And they don't have the responsibility to know they're going to stand before a holy and righteous God one day where the Bible said, prepare to meet thy God. That's the responsibility for your liberty. And if you're in the Old Testament, you've done what God told you, prepare to meet that God. I, I, I got some stuff wrong. Yes, I do. Lord, I failed. But I got some good stuff, Lord, that you're pleased with. A Christian in the church, eh? prepare to meet thy God. Yeah, for absent from the body, present with the Lord. If the rapture happens, I'm going up. Glory to God. I'm going. But uh, yeah, I got some wood, hay, or stubble. But a man that rejects Jesus Christ in this time period and his responsibility is going to stand before God, the great white throne judgment, and he's going to pay for his own sins in a place called hell forever. He had liberty. He had liberty. God's judging the nation with coronavirus. God's judging the nation with, with diseases. God's judging the nation with weather. God's judging the, with all these things. And the, and the people of America and the people of England and the people of the world have a responsibility with their liberty. What's their liberty? We're going to listen to God. We're going to obey God. And we're going to repent to God. Or Mother Nature, they're foolish. That guy don't know what he's talking about. That's preaching on the street. My God will take care of me. There is no God. Okay. That's your liberty. You have perfectly good liberty. Right or wrong. I will speak of thy testimonies. What's the greatest thing you... I can't witness. Tell them what happened to you. Tell them how you got saved. And if you can't tell them how you got saved, then guess what maybe the problem could be? What do you think maybe if you don't have the ability and the ways of telling them how you got saved? What could be the problem? Maybe you didn't get saved? Something more important than talking about what Jesus done for you? Guy in the Old Testament said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a testimony. I am going to stand up for Jesus. Well, I'm going to take that back. Guy in the Old Testament, I'm going to stand up for Jehovah. Look what, da look what David's written, all the things he's written about God. Those are testimonies. I will speak of testimonies also before kings. That's Paul and Jesus. Paul writes one of his letters and he says, in his farewell address, he says, I just want to you know, say hi to his family, say hi to these people. And those of Caesar's household says, hi. 
Caesar's household. I'm not talking about Caesar's salad. I'm talking about Paul had people that were Caesar's house that were given to Jesus Christ. Jesus stood before Pilate. Jesus stood before Herod. It will not be a shame. Again, so you show thyself a food on the God, work with that need, work in that. Yeah, need not to be ashamed, rightly divine and word of truth. There are many Christians who are ashamed because they don't read, they don't study. I will delight myself in thy commandments. There's now for him is thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, which I have loved. It kept them clean, it kept them guilt free. Hey, I don't have to worry about murder. Thing says thou shalt not kill. Okay, no problem. He, you know, he goes to work one day and he's got a covert. Well, wait a minute. Moses said, thou shalt not kill. Leave it be. Lord God, help me. This guy, you're lucky I have the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments says, thou shalt not kill. That's what's keeping you alive, buddy. They don't have the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. So what are people out there doing now? They're out there killing other people and they don't care. Boy, you'd be frightened if you walk in a courtroom and say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt... Oh, that's what I'm coming into this place for because I've done one of them crimes. No, no, no. You're guilty. We'll get rid of it. We'll get rid of it. My hands. Also, I lift up unto thy command. And that, that's the whole. No, that's not the Pentecostal. Don't do lifting your hands for show. Look at me, looking at me. No, it's just, you know, Lord, fill my hand. Lord, I'm raising up to you. You know, there's a right way of doing things and there's a wrong way of doing things. And when it comes to Pentecostal, that's the wrong way. Which I have loved. Again, I love the commandments twice. Verily, verily. I will meditate. I will think. I will pray. I will search. I will study in thy statue. Why? Because he has his whole heart set, verse 34. So God can enlarge his heart, verse 32. So he can lift up his heart, verse 36. Heart, heart, heart. 